Welcome to today's webinar, How to Develop Killer Training Techniques, brought to you by Pest Management Professional Magazine and our sponsor, Control Solutions. I'm Diane Safranek from North Coast Media, publisher of PMP Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to mypmp.net slash webinars and will be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Submit button in the lower left-hand corner of your console. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Our Twitter feed is placed in the upper right corner of your screen. You also may use the hashtag PMPWebinar to submit any questions during today's webinar or to enter into discussions with other attendees. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues on popular social media sites, all within the Share This widget at the bottom left. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Bethany Chambers or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Senior Editor of PMP Magazine, Will Nepper. Hi, as Diane said, I'm Will Nepper. I'm Senior Editor of PMP, and we're very happy today to have with us again Marie Knox, Technical Manager for Control Solutions and she'll be delivering her webinar, Delivering Killer Training Techniques. So we're very excited to hear what some of those are. And without further ado, I will let Marie take it away. Thank you, Will and Diane and Bethany. I appreciate being able to be here with everyone today. Today's topic is Developing Killer Training Techniques, and we will get started. Some of the topics we'll cover today include um, how people learn. Since we all learn differently, it's good to review um, just some of the facts on that. We'll touch on some tips and tricks you can incorporate into your current training program um, or ha help you get started in putting together your standard operating procedures and technician training programs. I'll review some free help that's available to get you started if you do not have standard operating procedures or formalized training programs in place. And then we'll have some discussion on customer retention as it relates to technician and sales staff personalities, follow through, and attitudes. We'll also have some discussion surrounding some of the questions that came in during the registration process for this webinar, including making training more enjoyable for the technicians as well as the trainer, looking at bad habits and how they're passed from more seasoned technicians to the newer hires, and how to curb it or how to stop it. We'll talk about how to write instructional objectives for standard operating procedures. You don't have to be a writer, um, and you don't have to consider yourself a good writer in order to put together simple um, instructional content. And also how keeping consistency um, is very important and how to get consistency back when it's been lost. And then we'll wrap it up with some, uh, some questions from the audience. So consistent training equals success. Over the last 15 or so years, I've been able to participate in training technicians, managers, sales teams for companies of all sizes, from the one-man operator just starting out to companies with national footprints and every size in between. Now, I would never say that I've seen it all, but I have, because that would mean it's probably time for me to wrap it up. I'm always seeing something new, but I have trained in people's garages, <laughs> people's living rooms when they're just starting out, all the way up to a national stage. Um, so I've definitely had some fun, uh, and, and hopefully I can share a lot of my experience with you today. One of the most profound realizations um, is that regardless of size, all companies need solid, new hire, and effective continuing training programs to ensure their continued growth and success over time. 
And something you're going to hear from me a lot today is that it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, so I don't want people to get hung up on thinking that, you know, only the, the large national companies have really buttoned up um, professional training programs and they must be really in-depth and difficult to create because it's not in-depth or difficult to create. And we'll go over a number of ways you can train um, so that you're comfortable with it and it fits what your goals are. So I'll ask you a few questions that you can think about. Do you have a training program in place for a newly hired technician? Do you have standard operating procedures, SOPs, for the different facets of your business? You might do um, general pest control only, so you might have um, SOPs for indoor general pest control inspection and application and, and perimeter pest control inspection and application. We might have some termite companies or you might also handle termite in your business. So you might uh, be considering termite inspection and treatment. And we also have some um, lawn care operators and pest control operators who also have lawn care divisions on the call. So you may have some lawn care inspection um, and application uh, concerns or topics that you, you would want to outline. If the answer is yes, that you have all of the above, then that is awesome. If the answer is no, don't worry, we will get you started actually building your programs by the end of this one. You will have a roadmap or a better idea of how to put it together. SOPs can be as complex or as simple as you make them. Remember, this is about what you want for your business, not what you see somebody else doing or trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You have to think about what you're comfortable with, what your objective is, and um, how you want to gain consistency in your business. Standard operating procedures do have um, uh, you know, a few common themes um, or a few common threads running through them. They do need to touch on the how, who, what, where, when, and why. And what I mean is you can consider how an inspection is done, how an application is made. The who might be chain of command. Think of it um, when you have a complaint call come in. Do you, as the owner or the manager or the supervisor, take it directly, or does it simply go immediately to the technician who did the original treatment? You, um, you do have a, a who as far as a chain of command. The what. The what might be what pests, or in the case of termite, what type of structure, what building, construction um, you're dealing with, or the what could be the products used. The when. You would want to define when to treat or when not to treat. Some pests don't need an actual treatment. They might need, need more of a, a cultural control method, um, maybe site modification or exclusion. And then in, in the case of lawn care, you might consider time of year uh, certain diseases in turf and ornamentals are active in the winter, whereas other diseases are, are active in the, the spring or summer. The same goes for weeds. And then back into the realm of pest control, um, the when could be pest, uh, certain pest species when they're active. Um, if you think of overwintering pests, like for those of you up in the mid-Atlantic, mid the Northeast, you have your stink bugs and you have um, ladybugs and, and certain overwintering pests that you know have a specific time frame um, when you would be dealing with them. And the why. The why is very, very important. Uh, one of the questions that came in during registration that I thought was wonderful, actually several questions came in kind of revolving around how do I get technician buy-in um, as far as believing in or paying attention to the training programs. And it's really the why. When you explain why you do something, Instead of just saying, do this, say, we do this because it gets us either this result or it helps alleviate this issue. When you provide the why, the why you do any of the above, then you engage your technician and you help them understand uh, why it's important that they do whatever specific step you're asking them to do. 
Providing drawings or even photos can help technicians know where your company applies certain products and why as well as it can outline areas to inspect. And we'll see some examples of some photos you could include in your training manuals um, near closer to the end of the program. Having standard operating procedures established and written down may even help reduce your liability later on. It's, uh, it's important to think about this. Uh, it's something that not many people actually contemplate, but when you do have a protocol written down, if ever there's an issue in the future uh, that could be litigation um, or liability, uh, at times having the way you do business, the way you do treatments outlined and written down and proving that you have a training program, that actually may be a benefit to you in the future. So when we are done today, if you don't already have SOPs or a training manual in place, you should at least have an idea of what is, av what is available to you and how you may want to tackle putting it together. If you do already have a system for training in place and in writing, you might just walk away today with some new ideas and material to freshen up your current program. And sprinkled throughout the program, we will talk about um, some examples for training. Remember, training doesn't have to be really intense and uh, you know, super hyper-scheduled out and organized before you do it. I want you to feel comfortable enough to, go, to be able just to call a simple meeting tomorrow if you wanted to and say, tomorrow morning we're going to have a training meeting at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Um, and go over XYZ labels. Um, so I want you to feel comfortable uh, understanding and embracing that, that training can take all forms and it can be as simple or complex as you make it. So let's get started. Training might not look or feel the same for a company with one to five technicians as it may for one with more than 50 technicians. But what is important is to realize um, that the same general concepts exist and need to be addressed. Just like I mentioned the how, who, what, when, where, and why, um, there are some other general concepts that, that need to be addressed and that they do run commonly regardless of the size of the company. It's beneficial for training. Training doesn't need to be fancy or expensive. There are many resources available to you that are simple and much of the time free, and we will go through all of these resources, um, so you should have a good list by the time we're done. The big investment that any company needs to make, however, is time. That really is the biggest investment is time. Time to devote to regular training meetings or exercises and time to create a simple, organized training plan for new hires and long-term employees alike. And I do want to drive home the point that you might not have anything written down today. You might not have a, a training program. You might not even have a training topic or any SOPs written, but that shouldn't stop you from calling a training meeting tomorrow if you want or deciding every Tuesday morning I'm going to train or deciding that the first Friday of every month I'm going to have a training meeting. You can hold a training meeting while you're in the middle of putting together your programs um, because I call it, well, it's commonly called analysis paralysis where you overthink something and then you never actually lead to doing anything. So I don't want you to think that you have to have some perfectly buttoned up program before you can call your first training meeting or decide to institute regular training meetings. Here's our, here's our discussion on, on learning, because we, we all do learn differently. Um, we'll talk a little bit about learning in general. Some people can read a paragraph and take a quiz and get an A, no problem. Others need to see an actual job or task being performed in addition to reading in order to score well, if you will, on the quiz. I'm a little bit of both. I can, I can read um, something and generally take a quiz on it, but if, if we're talking about an activity like making an application or mixing up product, I really do like to not only, you know, let's consider reading the label, but I also like to practice physically doing what 
I'm reading on the label. So I'm a little bit of both, and over the years I've worked with many PMPs, and the most successful training programs I've witnessed are ones that include both aspects of classroom training and hands-on training. And now I have these, I have classroom and hands-on, um, you know, in quotes, because I don't want it to be just what you, you might think it is. So classroom training can be anything in, in your technician training room inside. Classroom training could be something where you're giving a presentation or you're making a, you know, a, a quiz or you're having your technicians review labels of the products that are on your approved product list. Classroom training could also um, involve you know, using your computers and doing online training modules or even giving your technicians uh, a specific pest to research online, um, you know, say ghost ants and the best way to treat for ghost ants or the biology of ghost ants. So that's what I mean by classroom training. And you can have many more other ways to do classroom training. Now, hands-on training, you might think, oh, hands-on training, that's when you have your new technician ride with your more seasoned technician. Now, while that might be true, absolutely, that happens across the board, and, and I do believe it's necessary. Um, but other hands-on training is getting out in the field, or it's even just getting out in your own parking lot. We'll actually see a picture, and you'll know what I'm talking about, getting out in your own parking lot. Um, where you, you know, you actually put into practice or physically explore concepts um, that you're training on. So like looking at the size of a thousand square feet, what does that actually look like? Getting out in your parking lot, using cones and your measuring wheel and measuring off that area so that everyone can visually see what a thousand square feet looks like. And we'll get a little bit more into that, but hands-on training isn't just a ride along. Um, it's, it's physically touching the equipment, physically going through the motion of mixing product and seeing what a certain amount of product looks like. Um, it's, it's a lot more than just doing a ride along. So since we all learn differently, our training program should be varied enough to include hands-on in the field, online or video modules, reading and quizzes. Make the quizzes fun. They don't have to be torture for everybody. Um, it's great to vary the speakers and presenters if possible. That was a question that came in during registration was, you know, should you designate just one person to be the trainer? Now, it's great to actually have one person as the, like the, the person who houses all of the training material and they can be called the trainer um, or the supervisor, or whatever you want to call them. But it's, uh, it's important so that it's not just the same person over and over training the technicians. Technicians uh, and salespeople, they can get bored easily, just like we all get bored uh, if we see the same thing and hear the same person over and over. So it's nice to vary the speakers. Other people within the company can provide training or assist with the program. You could bring outside people in. Um, another, uh, another segment to consider is giving each technician an insect or topic to research and then present on it to the group. And it's just a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Maybe at each meeting you have one technician review something that they learned. It helps to engage your technicians. It helps them to start to learn to, to appreciate expanding their knowledge base on their own and then sharing that information with the others. And then there's always, you know, some other ideas and suggestions you guys can make. Um, uh, you know, every day other companies show me new and exciting ways uh, to train and to engage technicians. So why is training even important? So we're going over a lot of stuff before we actually get to showing you SOPs because this is some important background information. So bear with me. We, we actually will get into SOPs and training topics. Um, so why is it important? It's important because whether you've been on the job 20 years or 20 minutes, you need training. It's human nature to try to make our jobs easier or what we're doing go faster. But much of the time that involves creating shortcuts that over time may end up hurting our level of service and lowering our productivity and profitability. I want you guys to all, guys and gals, keep it in mind um, it's very common, you know, to, to want to fit more treatments in a day, treat more houses in one day, and we think we make more money that way. But when you, you hit a certain point where 
you start your, your service starts dropping off. You can't possibly provide the same high level of service your customers are used to if you're treating 20 houses when, you know, when you used to treat 10 houses a day and you had really great service. You can't, it's just not enough, not enough hours in the day to do it. So you have to realize that mm, sometimes becoming more efficient ends up hurting you, if that makes sense. So we need to make sure uh, that these shortcuts or bad habits don't get passed on. And that's kind of what happens when you've been out in the field for a long time and you're a seasoned professional, you kind of learn your own quick way of getting things done and then you know, your, your manager throws you a new technician and you're training that technician. And instead of training on the original standard operating procedure that might have been put in place by the management, the seasoned technician trains on the shortcuts, and those shortcuts can equal bad habits and not the best level of service. So just keep that in mind. So training is important um, for many reasons, and regular continued training helps to bring us all back to the basics, so we're less likely to reinforce any of those developing bad habits. What does training look like? Now, I mentioned before, it looks different from company to company and, you know, from different sizes of companies. So I sent out a survey to companies of all sizes across the country asking them if they have formal technician training programs in place, and if so, how they train, and what do they include as training methods and content. We're going to take a look at some of the questions, and as we discuss the findings, we'll get into the tips and tricks you can add to your own training arsenal. So simply the first question, just so you see uh, the, the kind of distribution of the companies that participated in the survey, the question was how many technicians does your company have? And you see a pretty even representation whether there's less than five technicians or more than 50 technicians. Um, you had all sizes of companies represented in this survey. The next question was, how many times per month do you provide some type of technician training? And there were some examples given, classroom training, invited representatives, biology, hands-on, like drawing graphs. That's a great training um, topic and something that can be done without really much preparation. So that could be tomorrow's training meeting. And math, believe it or not, uh, math. Math and public speaking scare people for some reason, but I've got some simple math um, scenarios in this presentation that you're, you feel free to, to take and use in training because touching up on math is always very important. But the overwhelming answer for how many times um, per month do you provide some type of training happened to be once per month. Now, some companies uh, answered every other week Another segment of companies answered every week. And then you had some companies that don't train at all and some companies that train every other month. But once per month was the most common answer to this question and it really seems to jive with my experience so far. I think once per month gives you the opportunity to touch base with everyone, all your technicians and your salespeople, check in and see what might be going well or not so well and root out any bad habits that you may see developing. Rewarding the good habits on a regular basis could also become part of your training meetings. So when you think of a training meeting, you know, try to think outside the box. You could have contests, you could work those contests into your meetings, you could offer rewards, you could do a quarterly contest, you could um, recognize one or two or however many technicians you want, you know, the ones who kept their trucks clean, something that simple. You know, you might have rules like no smoking in the company vehicles and every day you have to, you know, leave the inside and the outside of the truck clean and make sure that, you know, your boxes are locked, certain things. And, and you could actually, without your techs knowing, you know, kind of keep track of who's um, doing the simple things that are required of them and, and then offer a, a good habit reward. And that would also help incentivize the, the rest of your team to, you know, to want to receive some sort of award and hopefully they'd follow through and, and maintain their good habits. Now, you can train more or less than once a month. I get this question a lot. Um, I, 
it seems that people want the magic number. I get asked, how many times a month should I train? Should I train every week? Should I train every other week? Um, it's totally up to you. Honestly, it's up to you and what works for your company. But most importantly, what I want you to be honest with yourselves about is what can you maintain on a consistent basis? If, if you get really ambitious and say, I'm going to train every single week, I'm going to train every single Tuesday, but it's something that you really, you know, either you don't have the time for or it's just not possible right now, then don't worry about it and don't hold yourself to that because what happens is if you, you try to train every single Tuesday and you don't keep it up, um, your training program might fall completely by the wayside. So we just want to be honest with ourselves. What can we uh, realistically keep up on a regular basis? Because what's important with training is consistency and regularity. You want to, you want to train regularly, and that way you can get consistency across the board with your technicians. That's our, that's our hope and our goal. So if once a month is what you can do, that's awesome. Another question we looked at, we wanted some, uh, we offered up some suggestions or, or asked questions on what, uh, what of these lists of types of trainings do you offer in your organization? So this was one of those types of questions where they could check every box if they wanted to. So the top, the top offerings as training for companies, and remember, these are companies of all sizes that were represented, the number one response was ride-alongs with more seasoned technicians. Again, I, this is necessary, and it's, it's important, and I agree with it. However, it means we really need to make sure that our seasoned technicians are participating in the training courses that the new hires actually have to go through. Because we need to remind those seasoned technicians, these are the ones that could be making shortcuts and, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit of bad habits, and then they're, without, you know, without knowing it, they're passing these bad habits and shortcuts on to the new technicians. And if you already do have SOPs written, you know, what's happening in the field might not be what you originally intended. So ride-alongs with seasoned technicians are great, but we just have to make sure that everybody kind of gets brought back to square one with training and revisit, you know, how things are done and what your company uh, goal is for standard operating procedures for each facet. Now, the, the rest of them that came up pretty commonly, hands-on in-house training and invited distributor or manufacturer reps also got ranked pretty high. Label review training was ranked pretty high. These are all great ideas. So um, that pretty much rounds out that list. Now you'll see a little section that says other. And we invited the respondents for the survey to uh, let us know what that other category meant for them. And it actually, it produced some, some nice suggestions for training examples. So the other category noted on that previous slide represented the respondent suggestions, and that included defensive driver training, CEU presentations, either online. Remember, there's a lot of, a lot of content online, and we'll touch on specific content because just Googling something might not give you what you want. So CEU presentations, either online or in person through state association meetings. There's a lot of value in belonging to your association. Um, you could have a class on PPE or on core or safety topics. You could have a review of a specific or seasonal pest and have technicians research control tactics and then present it to the group. We mentioned that before. These are all very good additional training topics. The top answer as we mentioned before, was ride-alongs, having new techs ride along with more seasoned technicians. Now, I did touch on this, but I'll reiterate it. While this is very important and should be continued, in my opinion, we need to be aware that some bad habits or shortcuts could be passed on with each generation of technician in your company. And over time, what's happening in the field might not necessarily match what you originally intended. So how do we counteract the passing of this bad habit torch? We train, train, and we retrain. 
especially when we think we know it all or we have technicians or salespeople who think they know it all or have seen it all, we train. Sometimes it just takes thinking about what we do in a different way for things to click. So saying the same thing over and over again might lose its luster. So if we find a different way to say that thing, then we might uh, freshen up what uh, or how a, a technician or a salesperson perceives it. And training, I say technician a lot throughout this whole presentation, but it's not just for technicians. Owners, managers, supervisors, technicians, salespeople, CSR, we all need training. And so I just want to you know, keep that in mind. So here's an example of thinking differently, or at least putting it to a technician in a different way. When I train on lawn rig calibration, I like to use an analogy comparing lawn rigs to racehorses. Not really something that you hear out there, so people tend to listen. I usually say, think about it. You don't change the horse for the jockey. You fit the jockey to the horse. The same thing goes for your lawn rigs. You figure out their flow rates, and you use that information to train that technician how much volume they are putting out over a certain area during a period of time. All of your lawn trucks are going to put out five gallons of water in different amounts of time. So for the lawn guys on the call, line up all your lawn rigs, put a five gallon bucket behind each one of them, and have your techs fill that bucket and time it. Time how long it takes to fill the five gallon bucket. Um, all of them are gonna put out five gallons of water in different amounts of time. You cannot expect them to be the same, but what you can do is make sure that each technician knows the information for their individual trucks. And that will be helpful later on when we're talking about, um, you know, label, language, and rates. There's an example later on for, for lawn rates that that will actually help make sense. So while we're on the subject of calibration, here are some exercises uh, you can do either as a technician or a trainer. We've got everybody on the call to increase everyone's success and profitability. Seeing what a 1,000 square feet actually looks like, you can use your measuring wheel and mark it out with stakes or cones, and then practice walking this area at each person's normal pace and time, or let them count their paces. Let everyone get a feel for what this size of area looks like. Compare it to something memorable, like it looks like six parking spots or one-third of a tennis court, if that happens to, to be memorable for you. So I went and did this. I went to a parking lot, and I, I wondered how many parking spaces made 1,000 square feet, to be honest with you, because, I don't know, I just think, of, I think like this. And I figured out it's roughly six standard parking spaces about 18 feet by 54 feet, that's what a 1,000 square feet looks like. You can also do it in the grass. So you can do it in your parking lot at your office. You can do it in a field nearby or at a nearby park. This was at a park. I did some easy math here. 50 feet by 20 feet is a 1,000 square feet. So I used my measuring wheel. I put my cones out and took some pictures. Now, using this, once you've marked out the 1,000 square feet, you can let everybody have a spin around it with their normal spreader. Or, you know, you could, with a hose, you could uh, just have them walk as if they're dragging a hose um, just to get a feel for it. Obviously, there's not going to be product in the spreader because you're not going to be spreading a bunch of product over and over in that area. But just get an idea of how long it takes you to, to cover that 1,000 square feet. And right there is, is an easy, quick, free training meeting for you. It's also, good, it's also a good idea to take a look at what rates for your favorite granular products. And again, this can be for any product, but I'm just going to talk about granular for a second. Um, there are, there's a product that says two capfuls. You use two capfuls of product. Well, two capfuls to one person might mean two heaping capfuls, while to someone else it might be two level capfuls. So, it actually would be neat for your training book. And now you might call me old school. I have been around a little while. I, I like binders. I like books. It's taken me forever to kind of adopt reading on my iPad. I, I do that now. Um, but I, I'm still that person that likes to hold a book in my hands. And I'm still that person that prints things out. So I hope the environmentalists don't come get me. Um, 
And I like to put things in a binder and make a training binder or a training manual. I like to physically hold something. Now, you can organize your training program however you want, and if you love to have it in a file on your desktop on your computer, that's awesome. Um, but for me, I kind of like a physical presence of a, of a manual. So you could actually take those two capsules of product, set it on a table, and take a picture of it. And then take that picture and put it either, you know, where the label is in your three-ring binder for that particular product. You could slap that picture in there as a great visual to um, illustrate what that label is talking about. So taking pictures of what these amounts of product look like and adding it to that new technician manual, that's a great idea. Remember, we all learn differently from one another, so when you pair a picture with an amount, it may help the person learning to make a stronger connection. So I know it might sound elementary, but it's always a good refresher so that you're not putting too much or too little product out and wondering why you're spending either a ton of money on products or worse, why your callbacks are skyrocketing. Again, our goal is consistency. So these are all little things we can do to reach that consistent level. So do you know that 1,000 square feet also goes for general pest control applications as well? It does. Think about it. If you're applying a certain product, let's say it's a liquid concentrate, you have to mix it in water, and you're doing a 10-foot band around a 200 linear foot home. Well, that would be 10 times 200. That's 2,000 square feet. So if that particular product's label calls for one ounce of concentrate in one gallon of water per 1,000 square feet, then you're going to put two ounces of product in two gallons of water and put it out over that entire 2,000 square feet. Or you could even think about lawn applications that call for one ounce of product per 1,000 square feet in four gallons of water per 1,000 square feet. So if you're treating a 5,000 square foot lawn, here's these math examples that you feel free to steal. If you're treating a 5,000 square foot lawn, you'll need to put five ounces because it's one ounce per 1,000 in 20 gallons of water. I, you would be surprised I get called um, almost all the time asking about certain products. Um, you know, how many ounces do I put in my tank? How much do I put in my tank? And it, the questions really are, well, how far is your tank going? How many thousand square feet is, you know, 50 gallons treating, et cetera. So this is how you figure that out. And this is where we really need to review our labels and double check the flow output of the rigs or our backpacks and B&Gs on a very regular basis, and even our spreaders, our calibration, our spreader settings. So let's build some training programs. It's not rocket science. It's not rocket science, believe me, to put together a sound, well-rounded training program for your company that trains not only your new folks, but also your seasoned professionals. It can take some time and effort. Remember, time is your biggest thing that you got to commit. However, I know this is where many companies get stuck, and I know finding time can be very difficult, but it will pay off. And what I recommend is you're going to need to make the time. So it's kind of, it's, we'll go back to analysis paralysis. Try not to think about it too much. You'll be paralyzed, and you'll never pick a day, and you'll never pick a time, and you'll never start writing down what you do. So just jump. Just say, okay, I'm going to do it once a month, and you know, next Wednesday is my first day, or we're going to do the first Friday of every month. You need to just simply block out that time and stick to it. As long as you can stick to it and follow through yourself, then you'll get consistency, you'll get regularity of training, and you'll end up seeing over time it'll build on itself, and you'll end up producing those manuals that you want. But remember, you don't need the SOPs and the manuals in place to start training. Getting consistency in your inspections and your treatments and having consistency across all of your technicians, new or seasoned, will allow you to pinpoint issues faster and eventually will help you better manage your materials use and costs. Setting aside a day a week or a day a month or even an hour a week um, to work on it will be a small manageable time investment to create a great program. But you just have to start and that's the hardest thing is literally starting. Remember, it's not set in stone. 
your training program does not have to be perfect. And newsflash, it's never going to be perfect. It is a work in progress. All of my training programs, I never consider them perfect. They're never done. And some people are uncomfortable living like that. But you have to accept that because things change, products change. You're going to have to refresh your programs. Um, and the materials will change, and they'll, they'll vary depending on a lot of scenarios. So don't feel like your program has to be perfect before you roll it out. It's always going to be a work in progress. And it's, it might be nice to involve your technicians, your sales staff, maybe some of your CSRs, depending on, on what training manual you might be putting together at the time. But encourage them to, to look over what you're working on and help make them part of the process, process. This can help instill some ownership in them. And it might you know, give you a fresh set of eyes and a different way of thinking about something when you do uh, need to refine and tweak your programs. So simple is best, and we're getting into the programs now. Um, we're going to go over all of where you could find a bunch of free information. Um, I like to say simple is best and inexpensive is even better. So not only should it be relatively easy to organize, but it should also not cost an arm and a leg to put programs together or put training binders or manuals together, whatever you want to call them. Many training tools are available now that are free, yes, free. So we're going to take a look at a few of the freebies out there. YouTube videos from trusted sources, okay? Trusted sources like universities, product manufacturers, distributors, industry experts. So be careful, you know, when you go on, be just like with Google, with YouTube, be careful what you're looking for. Um, not everything is, a, not everyone is a trusted source. So make sure the source is good, like the University of Florida, your local university, depending on where you are in the country, um, most likely have, they have some cool YouTube videos. I know a lot of product manufacturers, if you go to their websites, they have videos on their websites on how to actually use their products. And those can be incorporated free into your training programs. You can have monthly hands-on calibration and equipment training at your office. You can also have monthly equipment cleaning. How often are your BNGs taken apart, rinsed, cleaned, screens replaced, and put back together? I'm sure there's a whole range of answers right now coming out of everybody. Practical math. I know everybody loves math. Don't laugh too much. Um, but math skills are great to review every couple months or so. And uh, you know, you feel free to use the math examples in this presentation, or come up with some more, you know, based on the products that you use and that you approve in your company. Label reviews. Go ahead and call your qualified distributor or manufacturer representative. They should know their labels better than than most. They can help you uh, guide, or they can help guide you where their products work best and where they don't and hopefully they tell you that, and update you on label changes. So inviting somebody new to come in not only freshens up your training day, but it gets you off the hook for training, just an FYI. Um, and you can sit back with your feet up and watch somebody else train and uh, you know, help with the label, help go over the label and, and offer a nice program. You could also create quizzes. Quizzes don't have to be tough or boring, and you can make them fun and easy for any product label that you have. And it's nice to offer small prizes. That's a fun idea, because when you can get your technicians and your sales folks or even your CSRs, you could train everybody at once. And I do a lot of trainings where everyone's in the room um, because the companies generally want cross-training to occur. Uh, so, so it's very helpful to involve everybody if you possibly can. But getting them to compete with one another uh, during the training for a small prize helps really engage, engage them. And it also helps with buy-in. Uh, usually they can, um, they'll come up with some neat ideas as well. It depends on how you're, how you're involving them. So small prizes are great. You could do a PPE quiz. Um, I did a PPE quiz, which was actually, um, this was more of a contest. You can spread out on a table, either out in your parking lot or um, in your office, uh, a bunch of different pieces of uh, personal protective equipment. You can have goggles, respirators, Tyvek suits, you know, Tyvek gloves, what have you. Um, and have them 
put on what they think is required for a specific product. So you might have 20 products that you use in your, you know, your day-to-day -day business. You could just pull a name of a product and then they have to guess the proper PPE that might be on that label. And it's good when technicians, you know, obviously know and learn what PPE is necessary for different products. You could have a rate quiz. So commonly used products, you could quiz um, your technicians on the rates, the proper rates for those products that you use commonly. Some free materials. This is a snip of, this is like a little snippet of a, a distributor's website. They, um, they offer, there's a lot of different distributors out there. Some of them have websites where if you're a customer, you can log in and, you know, it's like a secret or customers only section of their website and you can print examples of contracts and inspection forms. Um, it's very helpful when you're building your own training manuals. You know, you don't need to recreate the wheel. Uh, if you have your own inspection forms, that's great. If you want to look at other ones that are out there, there are free ones available that are helpful. They might add, you know, they might add to what you currently have. It saves time, and like I mentioned, it's oftentimes free uh, if you're a customer. And there's even some training videos on some distributor websites, and again, like I mentioned, manufacturer websites. And that was one of the questions that came in uh, during registration is where can I find training videos? Well, um, think about who you purchased your products from and you know, start asking questions to see if they have some that are, are available online. And also universities, like I mentioned YouTube before, um, good qualified sources. You want to make sure you have qualified sources and expert sources, but they often post videos to either their websites or to YouTube channels. Your own state websites might offer free forms for you to use. So again, why create the wheel? Some states might make it mandatory for you to use some certain forms for some categories, and they might also offer free examples for other um, categories. This one happens to be from Florida, and it's a mandatory one. It's, it's a wood destroying organism form. But um, just keep in mind, even your own state might offer some free information for you to use and incorporate into your programs. Leading universities with strong entomology, plant pathology, et cetera, programs, um, they oftentimes have a, a wealth of publications available. So you can go directly to the university's website and then type in, you know, entomology or type in um, turf grass. And it's, it can lead you to a bunch of their publications and their content. Now this one happens to be from the University of Florida, my school, and it's called Featured Creatures. And believe it or not, um, as a graduate student, we all had to produce um, – we all had to basically take creatures, if you will, and produce articles on them. So uh, you could actually have your technician go, you know, your technicians go to a site like this. If you happen to be in Florida or the southeast, um, this is a pretty great source. They could pick a creature and present it to your company once per month. So it can be that easy. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, three days worth of work for your technician to research a topic. It could be as simple as going to something like featured creatures, picking a bug, and then talking about it. Um, with the rest of your company. State and industry associations might also offer free to their members several things. Contract examples. It's always great to brush up on your contracts. I know that's not necessarily part of today's topic, but um, it's nice to refresh your contracts and look into them. Forms, whether it's inspection forms, um, graphing guides, Training opportunities, they might offer free in your area, local training opportunities, discounts. That one's getting off topic too, but it's still good to know that when you belong to your state and, and the national organization uh, or association, um, it's good to know that you might you know, be afforded some discounts and other perks for belonging. Now, you don't need to feel overwhelmed or alone. There are so many resources available to you in our industry. Um, lastly, check your publications or your subscriptions, your monthly magazines, and also the magazine websites like PMP Magazine have training topics and even in-depth articles on specific pests. And you can start 
actually there if you want. You could start building a resource library there. Heck, you could get yourself a three-ring binder. You could put spiders in, on the front of it if you want, and every time you come across a good spider article um, or go online and print off some good spider information, you put it in the binder. It can be that simple to get started. So don't think that it has to be you know, difficult. It's not difficult. We make it more difficult than it actually is. So creating the organized program. Organizing your standard operating procedures based on the category or the area being treated will be helpful. So don't try to write a giant manual that covers everything in your business. Just start small. Take one segment. Take indoor pest control. And then write down what you would expect to do when you visit the structure. That's how it's as easy as it can be. You just start thinking about, well, we have inspection techniques. Well, where do you inspect? How do you inspect? Why do you look in these certain places? Write that down, and that starts forming your inspection techniques part of your protocol. Conducive conditions to look for. You could take some pictures, and you could list the conducive conditions and put that in the manual. Cultural techniques. Talk about sanitation or clutter control, food storage options that you could actually recommend to the homeowner. That's something nice you could add to your, to your training programs is you could have little areas where, you know, if your tech runs into this, they could suggest X, Y, Z to the homeowner. So it's nice um, to offer, that's like a little value added service when you can offer other suggestions for the homeowner, like food storage options. If, you're, if your homeowner is having a problem with stored product pests, you might want to suggest, you know, that they remove the food from the cardboard or paper containers that they come in from the store and put them in resealable or sealed containers in their pantry or refrigerator. That's just an example. And then applica application techniques. If you do have to make applications, obviously read your labels and um, outline how you make those applications um, according to the label. And it could be for baits, it could be for liquid sprays or for dust, and where you might apply those products. So here's an example of an interior general household pest control inspection checklist. Um, hopefully it's clear. It just talks about, you know, it kind of checks off and is, is a little roadmap, if you will, for your technicians to follow when they're going through the inside of a house, where they might look in the kitchens and in, in the bathrooms and what they might find. They can make notes. And it's just nice to have this little roadmap for each of their accounts. Visuals or pictures of how and where to inspect and treat are very helpful in a training manual. And they also support the inspection and application checklist that you may have or intend to make. So let's take a look at a few inspection and treatment photos for kitchens and interior pest control. This happens to be a shot of a void. So this is a kitchen in mid-construction. You'll notice that um, in the first photo, the upper left, uh, that the kick plate's not underneath the cabinet against the floor where it should be. But it's nice to show that there's a void there. And it helps to teach, you know, some people might not know anything about construction. They might not even know what you're talking about when you say treat the voids or be mindful that there are voids or dead space underneath cabinets or next to the wall. And then here's um, a cable um, cover moved away from the wall, maybe dusts would be used in that situation, you know, or foams. It's nice to have pictures like this to show, uh, to illustrate what you might be writing down in your manuals. You could take pictures of treatments actually being done, showing where dusts might go or that you might uh, be taking off outlet covers and inspecting or treating there, or pulling drawers out and placing baits. Maybe it's a gel bait. Maybe there's an aerosol being used. These are all just examples of what you could put in your training manual. For outside treatments, you know, a lot of labels talk about where wires or utilities enter the structure as an area to treat. So just take a picture of where wires or utilities enter the structure and put that in the manual and highlight the label, um, showing them this is what that means. And then the picture on the right is landscaping and maybe showing, you know, you could draw on the photographs 
and say this is where we put granular baits in this landscaping area or in uh, a few of the pictures coming up it might be where we inspect there's a crack here by the window that could be a pest entry point you see the picture of the garbage cans you could say if you see a refuse or garbage collection area and it's close to an entry point that is a pest entry point and that's a conducive condition or could provide harborage for or breeding sites for pests here's some more um, treatment photographs you could take pictures of of your technicians doing treatments and then put them in the manual treating entry points inspecting an outdoor kitchen so those were just a few examples of of what you could um, basically use to illustrate or bring to life what labels say and bring to life what your standard operating procedures and your manuals say so looking at uh, general household pest or GPC outdoor perimeter pest control. So we talked a little bit about indoor, but if you're talking about outdoor, we would touch on, um, you'd write about inspection techniques, like what to look for, conducive conditions, what types of pests you might have. You could have a regional company. You could be in the Northeast and have a totally different pest spectrum uh, than the people in the Southeast or the Midwest. You could talk about cultural control methods like web removal or downspout redirection outside. You saw some pictures of downspouts. Um, and you, know, you can remark what you should look for in that area. Application techniques, again, read your labels. This is the how. Um, some products can be power sprayed. Some can be put out using a backpack or a B&G. Some products are liquids or baits. And it depends on what you use in your in your arsenal, that's what you would write about. And then application maps. I'm going to show you a map that I really like, um, or some diagrams, so that technicians know what goes where. You know, there's a section, there's certain, like some products are just on the immediate perimeter or the surface of the structure on the outside. Some products can be put in the mulched beds or landscape perimeter and turf. And then other products, you know, you can go out as far as maybe the pool or pump house or treat wood piles, et cetera, or underneath wood piles, I should say. It all depends on the products. So here's a diagram, and this is courtesy of Black Pest. So thank you guys for letting me use um, your training diagram. This is straight out of their perimeter training program. Um, they use this nice diagram. They happen to divide their training up into zones, and they talk about zones. Zone one is the house, zone two is landscaping, zone three are more uh, like further away from the structure type situation. But you could do this. This is a great visual, especially for your new hires, to show them where you might use, inspect or use certain products. Visuals are definitely awesome, awesome tools. So here's a few more, just, you know, this, these deal with termites. Using pictures and maps and drawings help illustrate inspection and application techniques. And many pictures can be found online for free, just so you know. And here's a couple for termites. Some of them are drawings, like, of a foundation on the lower right-hand side where, you know, termites might enter or some elements of construction so that your technicians who might be treating have a better understanding of what's underground or what could be there. And then there's a crawl space picture with, a, you know, a beam and a pier and some mud tubes going up it. These are great to illustrate what's going on. And, and until your new hires see this for themselves in the field, it's a wonderful way to get them started. You could even provide some exterior pictures and draw on them. Now, I used a, you know, a little simple computer drawing here to mark out where products could be used. But as an example, you know, a product might be one foot up, one foot out, like you see here along the foundation wall. And maybe it could be put around, around the window and around the sliding glass door and up into the soffit vents um, or around the soffit vents. So, you could provide these types of illustrations for the specific products and labels that you use. A few more examples of training photos. Um, just showing some labels say that, you know, vegetation touching the structure can provide a route of entry for pests. So showing a picture of that, like the picture on the right. And, um, you know, maybe even that downspout picture on the left would be helpful. 
to illustrate where treatment might be or where you might find conducive conditions. Lastly, some math visual training aids. Um, feel free to use these. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, my email address will be at the end, and I'd be happy to send them to you. But it's just figuring area. This one, you know, maybe could be used for calculating area for termite treatment applications. Going over items like this, these are great little snippets, little ideas for training classes. So finally, we're going to talk briefly about habits and customer retention before we wrap it up. Um, we're going to talk about technician and sales staff personalities, follow through, and attitudes. So we all have different personalities, and some of us are naturally social and strike up conversations easily with just about anybody. Like my mom, we say that she would talk to a wall if it would talk back, while others might be a little less outgoing. And either type of personality is fine in our industry, but we do have to recognize that we are in a service business. And we do have face-to-face -face contact um, from time to time. And sometimes our customers need that face-to-face -face contact, or at the very least, something a little more personal than an email, so a telephone call. So even though we all have different personalities, we do all have to be willing to at least be available enough to provide the level of service uh, that we are expected to. And all sales staff, CSRs, and techs, um, really do need to be willing to talk to their customers. One thing that I that gets brought up to me is the sales versus technicians rut. And um, over the years, I've noticed this pattern, and it, and it boils down to sales um, do the talking and technicians do the treating. And you know, implying that your sales team is your brand ambassador team. But really, this couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, they are brand ambassadors, but you have to consider that everybody in your company is technically a brand ambassador for you. So your technicians are your brand ambassadors long after the sale has closed. They have the most opportunities for contact with your customers, and that makes it ex exceptionally important for them to represent your company well. So sometimes that just means taking five minutes to talk to a homeowner before they race on to the next account. and touching on follow through. These are all, uh, there were some questions that came in about customer retention, and so that's where these, these last few slides came from. So follow through is, is not just for the sales team. If a homeowner or customer has a question and we don't have the answer, just be honest, let them know. We might not know it at this time, but write it down or instruct your technicians to write it down and then get back to that customer with the answer in a timely manner. And go ahead and set the expectation of the customer by telling them when to expect an answer and stick to that promise. Our customers simply want to be treated how we want to be treated, and it's not difficult. But sometimes we let schedules and stress and even sometimes fear, fear of talking to somebody, fear of giving the wrong answer, get in our way of providing excellent service. And we need to think about it, just dial it back to the basic level, and we're just people talking to people. And it's nice to, to basically follow through and deliver what that customer would want. Because I'm sure you would want the same thing from the people you buy from. Lastly, attitude. We need to be aware that individual attitudes can make or break a salesperson, a technician, a CSR, a manager's, or even an owner's career. Treating others as you want to be treated is very important. And remembering to say thank you. Remembering that although we're all very good at our jobs, we are not the only thing that exists. And they can get their pest control service or their lawn care service or depending on who else you are on the call, their products from somebody else. So appreciating the fact that they're getting it from you is, is amazing. It, it works wonders. And understanding that nobody's perfect, but when you treat your customers with respect and follow through, they will do the same for you. That equals customer retention. And talking about this is actually a very good training topic. That wraps up my portion. I want to thank everybody. We're not finished yet because we are going to move to questions, but I wanted to make sure that I thanked all of you for spending your time with us today and attending this webinar. And now we're going to take um, some questions. 
Thanks, Marie. Uh, another great presentation from Marie Knox with Control Solutions. Uh, we'll jump into some questions we got uh, during registration and a couple that we got actually during the presentation. Uh, we'll start with this one. We feel the direction of training is going towards short, small subject content. One area, very specific detail for under 10 minutes with a pre and post quiz. Do you agree? Um, that's actually, yeah, that's that's like a, a great example for another example you could add to the list of of how to train or just training topics. So, so they're saying a short, like instead of taking general pest control and all of its facets, just take maybe one ant and talk about it in very specific detail for a short amount of time, like under 10 minutes, and give a pre and a post quiz. I think that's wonderful. If that works for you, um, then keep doing it. And that's also, you know, keeping things short, I've learned, um, and, and that's, that's been hard for me. I can tell you I could talk all day long to you guys. Um, but keeping things short and trying to keep it succinct and organized actually keeps people engaged and it helps better with their retention. So I think that's a wonderful idea. I think that's great that they do training in that manner. All right, uh, another one here. We like to customize our treatment programs for the individual client depending on their needs and wants. How do I develop application procedures to follow? That's really good. That's good. A lot of companies, um, I didn't touch on you know, branching off of the original program in, the, in our program, but I think for somebody, this kind of also sounds, these type of treatments are also kind of high end. Um, they don't always have to be, but it'd be good to for everybody to have a, a skeleton. Companies like this might have a skeleton standard operating procedure um, where they have the, basic, the basics that get done, and then um, I guess depending once they meet with their clients, the, maybe the add-on services or the specific pest problems that that client is having might um, guide how the standard operating procedure, if you will, for that account is written um, for the technician to follow. So I think um, developing application procedures for this would be first start with a skeleton program, a basic SOP for that that thing, whether it's interior pest control, exterior pest control, lawn care, develop a, a basic skeleton program, and then develop little side programs that can kind of be hitched on to that basic skeleton. So if they have, you know, a, if you have some problem pests, like white-footed ants or if you have Formosan termites, you know, specific pests that might need a little different protocol that you might have to tweak an original protocol for, make little mini protocols for those specific items or pests or issues, and then you can tack on to your skeleton program so that you're not always recreating the wheel. Have your basic program model and then little sub-programs that you can tack on as needed if that makes sense. And this is a question that came in during the presentation. How do you feel about technician signatures on SOPs and keeping them in a training folder? So I'm wondering, you mean like, I wonder if it means having them sign off that they- That's what, that's that how I was interpreting it, it. That they had, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what? That's and not a problem. Those on file. I, yeah, you know, I think um, I, I don't see any issue with that, and I I kind of see an upside to it. Um, it it might help hold the technician accountable for sticking to the SOP. But one thing I do want to I want to remind everybody is that this isn't just an initial push. Like when you say you're going to launch the SOPs and or you're going to revisit your SOPs. It's not just something that, oh, hey, we're going to do this in the month of August, and then we're going to let it die on the vine, and we're not going to do it again you know, for six months. You want to revisit them regularly. So if you, you know, launch SOPs, and then you have your technicians fully read and understand it, and you go through training on it, and then you have your technician sign it, that is awesome. I, I do believe it will help um, hold them accountable. 
And, but remember that if you don't do things regularly and consistently, then you won't get consistency. So you'll want to revisit that SOP regularly, maybe once a quarter, and remind all of your technicians, this is how we do things, because I guarantee you, by the time you get to the next review, a quarter later of that SOP, people will have already made shortcuts out in the field. And so you'll want to revisit it regularly and um, remind them that this is how we do things. So signing off is a great idea, but I wouldn't just sign it and then forget about it and think that it takes care of itself. I would say, you know, make it a recurring, regular thing. Okay. Um, some of these questions that came through in pre-registration pre are they're written, so I'm going to interpret this one the best I can. Your thoughts on creating an audio file to be played en route to a service job, a review of what to expect, for example, an ant job, a roach job, um, stinging insect job, or the unexpected, uh, with a list of what tools would be needed and procedures to do. I think that's kind of cool. So like they would make, it's like a book on tape. <laughs> Wow, I'm really mm -hmm. old by saying book on tape. Um, <laughs> um, I'm really not that old. Um, so it, that's kind of neat, creating an audio file. I didn't even think of this. This is, uh, this is a great suggestion, number one. Um, I, I think it's wonderful. And then your technicians say they're going on a bee job. You mentioned stinging in, insects. Yeah, pop in or you know, play that file depending on what kind of vehicle you have, you know, play that audio file that deals with bees or play the audio file that deals with ants. Um, I think that's great. I, that's uh, that's kind of out of the box and really forward thinking. All right. Well, thanks to whoever submitted that question. Um, yeah, thank you Another one that. we have here. I hope you're on the line. <laughs> Another one, we have any suggestions for incentives for techs as encouragement to keep themselves educated on a regular basis in addition to just a mandated training meeting. I do something every day to increase my knowledge and would love my technicians to have the same attitude about knowledge and education. Oh, I like that. First, I want to say, whoever wrote this in, I'm glad you do something every day to increase your knowledge. I subscribe to the Merriam-Webster word of the day. So that comes to my email inbox every day. So I, I like language and words and um, kind of nerdy like that. So I think it's wonderful to do something every day to increase your knowledge. It can be something as simple as learning a new word or reading about a pest. Um, Let's see, how would we incentivize technicians to do that? If that's, your, if that's how you run your business or if that's how you run your life, hopefully that's, it comes in through to your business. And that would be a company culture then that you're trying to foster. So you could, I mean, the, the person who wrote this did include the word incentive. So incentives for technicians to encourage them. You could, um, I mean, you could, Ask them what they're passionate about, and because it, it could encompass all general knowledge, not just pest control knowledge, but ask them what they're passionate about, and then ask them to maybe subscribe to um, you know, an email newsletter or something and be able to share that with you know, at the training meetings, the monthly training meetings, or if you want to narrow it down and keep it pest control. Um, ask them, you know, what part of the job they're most passionate about, or are they really into spiders, or do they, do they really love cockroaches, um, and, and let them kind of do something that they love so that it's not mandated, you know, because mandated training when you're just being force-fed something, that doesn't always stick. In fact, most of the time it doesn't stick. You've got to get buy-in, um, and you have to have them involved and eager to learn. So this is, a, this is actually a really, really good question. But incentivizing them by letting them pick something they're passionate about and, um, you know, kind of getting them involved with sharing that then at the monthly meetings, hopefully that will help to foster that, that love of learning something new and then sharing it with those around them. Um, and, and coming from a, a non-mandated type angle, 
uh, would be best to help, you know, because if you're forced to do something, you, you generally fight it forever. But if you're allowed to pick your passion, then um, you'll most likely stick with it. So hopefully that offers some sort of framework for getting there. Okay, uh, we'll do one more question here, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. I'll pass it back to Diane. What do you consider the most important part of training? Um, consistency. Anything you can stick to. That's the most important part. I mentioned all sorts of different kinds of training you can do. You know, free training, simple training. You could you could announce a training meeting for tomorrow morning, grab a label and walk in that room and read the label with the guys and the gals, and that's a training meeting. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy or expensive uh, or, you know, or just off the wall, um, but it does have to be regular and consistent because that's how we develop good habits um, and consistent habits, consistent good habits. So if you whatever you can do, just do it do it regularly to make it be consistent. That's that's probably my most important um, most important part of training. So anyway, with that, I want to say thank you to everybody, and then turn it on over to Diane. Thank you for attending the How to Develop Killer Training Techniques webinar presented by PNP Magazine and by our sponsor, Control Solutions. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the PNP website and will be emailed to you tomorrow. Look for exclusive articles on mypmp.net that answer many of the questions you may have submitted for today's webinar. Please go to mypmp.net slash webinars for more information about our next event in the Basics for Better Business Habits series. Thank you for attending and enjoy your day.